Hi, everyone. Perhaps the most often asked question I've heard among people in our community here is, what am I doing here right now? Did I really sign up for this point in history? And what's my purpose in life? Um, this is something that is a ubiquitous question, I know. But we tend to think that it's too difficult to find out because we don't have a sense of our own birth and agreements we had before birth. But according to Sean Olar and his co-authors of a wonderful little book called Why, we can determine exactly what our purpose is by looking into our current life right now with some true reflection. And he's, they've written this beautiful little book that takes you right there. So at the end of a day or so, you can look at it and say, oh my God, I know why I'm here. I know what I'm supposed to work on. I know what my purpose is. So let's go to Sean. Hi, Sean. It's good to have you back with us again. Thanks, Regina. Good to see you. People just love the purity of your heart and your words last time. And this is such an important discussion. And it came as a result of when you and I were having about the difference between an ideal that we carry versus what we actually value, because a lot of times we think they're the same and they're actually not. So before we get into that, you along with uh, Matthew McKay and Ralph Metzner, wrote a book. It's a little book called Why, and it is an incredibly powerful tool to help people assess where they really are in life, what their chief talents and skills and characteristics and desires are, and what this means in terms of what our true path in life is. So thank you for writing that book. What inspired you guys to come together to do that? I have known Matt for a long time, uh, and um, I had the privilege of, uh, of uh, talking with him. Uh, his son died very tragically in San Francisco, age like 21, you know, and it was a devastating. A young, he was just killed in a drive-by shooting, just a total accident, coming home from work on his bicycle. And Matt, as you can imagine, was really devastated. So he and I got together, and we started talking about, you know, life after death, we got into reincarnation. We got into what I call a preconception contract. We became fast friends, you know, and he and his dead son actually have written two brilliant books afterwards. So you check out Matt McKay. Uh, he's in contact with his son at the other side and uh, they have this conversation. And Matt has written two brilliant books, one just very recently and one a few years ago. The first one is called Seeking Jordan. Jordan was his son. And I would recommend them very, very highly to anybody who wants to look at the journey of a grieving father uh, fight, trying to find meaning in the, uh, the, the uh, pathological killing of his innocent little, little child. So uh, that's how Matt and I got together. And at, at one stage, then he invited me to, to collaborate with him, you know, and to write this book, because we were talking about what is the purpose of life, you know, and so um, uh, we invited uh, Ralph Metzner to, to submit a chapter to that. And uh, so that the book came out, I think, about uh, 2013, and it's called Why, What Your Life is Telling You About Who You Are and Why You're Here. And as you mentioned, it's a little slim volume, about 130 pages, but it's packed with really interesting ideas and uh, practices. Yeah, it is. And also, by way of example, I think you did a really good job because the, the examples are more masterful than what you see. They're not cliche at all. They really speak to where people are. And so one of the things in the book that I found um, interesting is you start right off at the top talking about the subjects of joy, happiness, and pleasure, yeah. because it does seem in today's world where people are overwrought with anxiety, um, confused messaging, and so forth, that we're increasingly seeking pleasure. Yes. yes. Not even happiness, but yes. pleasure. Right. And that has a whole... There's this connotation to that's really quite physical, electrical, um, and has to do with our neural wiring. So yeah. let's talk for a moment about the difference between joy, happiness, and pleasure. That's a very important distinction, Regina, because they're often used as synonyms, and they're radically different from each other. So joy is the ecstasy of the present moment. It's uh, watching a sunset, you know, while you're engaged with the sunset, maybe kissing your beloved, you know, it might be just uh, playing a, a sport, you know, running a hundred meter dash or whatever, but you're, you're totally focused and present to the moment. And that's what joy is. Joy is living completely in the present moment. It's really a kind of like a Buddhist or a Hindu notion in the now, but that doesn't last ever. 
And so then the reason doesn't last is we shift our attention. We are no longer in the now. Most of us are using the now, you know, in order to kind of dredge up old memories, which make us angry or guilty, our future possibilities, which makes us make us anxious and afraid. So we're constantly hijacking the present moment, you know, for the past and for the future. So joy is the ability to be in the present moment and to totally savor whatever is happening right now. And that can be anything. It's not just pleasurable kinds of stuff. Being present to your pain even is a well-known way of actually transcending the pain, you know, and identifying with, not with your spacesuit, but with your soul, your spirit in the spacesuit. So joy then is this uh, ability to be totally present to the moment. And most of us abandon that very quickly. Pleasure is absolutely just a neurological activity. All mammals are programmed to habituate to pleasure. So, you know, I, I love, you know, I'm a, I love chocolate and stuff. So my favorite ice cream is rum raisin ice cream. I could eat it by the tub load. But uh, <laughs> after the, you know, the second or third tub, you know, I don't want to see you know, rum raisin ice cream anymore. Yeah. So every single mammal is actually habituated, you know, hab- habituates to any kind of a pleasurable activity. And so uh, addiction then is attempting to satisfy the pleasure principle by ha- having more and more frequent or bigger and bigger doses of whatever it is that I think is giving me pleasure. Yeah. Okay. So that's a problem. That's because a huge you problem. To a point when you have such, e- when your life has such easy access to the things that give you pleasure that you have to keep upping the dosage, upping it and upping it. And I think that gets into what happens a lot of times when we think of some of the people that have made it really big early on in life, say Hollywood stars, where everything's made available. They can experience anything they want. They can afford it. The people will provide it. And then you, like you you say in the book, to satisfy that chemical response, you have to up it, you have to up it. So it has to be a higher dosage of whether it's sex or drugs or whatever, it just has to keep going up. So you're saying we're hardwired toward this if we can get our hands on it. Every single mammal, it's not just human beings, your kitty cat. If you want to scratch her belly, she wants more and more scratching the belly. Right, that's true. Right? And so every mammal is actually neurologically wired to habituate uh, to, to pleasure. So it's not never going to last. And so we either have to do it more frequently and up the dosage, and then we're, we become addicted yeah, to a substance or relationships or whatever. Now, it's interesting that Hinduism has actually a great hit on this. Hinduism claims that there are kind of four series of incarnations that happen to a soul on this journey to enlightenment. So the first series of, of uh, incarnations have to do with the pleasure principle, and the Hinduism says there's nothing wrong with that if it can be controlled and done well. Right. There's nothing wrong with a good wine or a good sex. They'll teach you the Kama Sutra to enjoy sex more or whatever. So they say there's nothing wrong with that as long as it doesn't dominate your life. But after a certain number of incarnations dedicated to the pleasure principle, you move into the second level, which is a, a kind of a fascination with power, privilege and prestige. Now, these are the kind of people then who become psychopaths and who become, you know, addicted to power and to control over others. And where the pleasure principle only creates problems for myself or my immediate family, if I overindulge, the power principle creates literally global problems. Because people who get to that stage, and they're very often pathological, are going to exercise that power to control the resources and everybody else. So, but after a few incarnations in that, the idea is that you'll go beyond that and realize there's nothing wrong with power as long as it's self-empowerment and the empowerment of others, as long as it's not control and domination of others. But at some stage, Hinduism says, you're going to realize there must be a place beyond power, privilege, and, and, and prestige. And that is the service principle, the realization that we're all bite-sized bits of source and that we have to look out for each other. They are the kind of Mother Teresas of the world who are picking little babies off the streets of Calcutta and loving them and feeding them. So uh, service is the third series of incarnations. But even that is an illusion because it's predicated on the notion of separation, that we can only be compassionate to others if we believe that they're separate from us. So the final stage of of reincarnational process is uh, moksha, what they call moksha, liberation a kind of liberation from the notion that we are separate from God, that we're separate from each other, and that we're separate from nature. 
So Hinduism gets into this notion as well that you know uh, pleasure, you know, and power these these things, they're they're pitfalls, they're illusions that are going to trap us. And so the third stage then that you asked about was happiness, and happiness very simply is being aligned with the purpose for which you incarnated. Happiness only comes from that. And that means that you have to be able to harvest every occurrence in your life, every relationship in your life, and every event in your life for spirituality. So it is the realization that when you cleave to what you came to do and you align with that purpose, you're going to be a very happy camper. Even if you're in pain, even if bad things happen to you, you'll be able to harvest every single one of these things for spiritual purposes. So that's what that's the difference then between just uh, mere joy, uh, mere pleasure, and happiness. That's so beautifully said. And I think as people are listening to this, we're all looking at where we are on this scale, because we're in a point a point in history of extreme materialism, where in order to uh, satisfy the pleasure principle takes nothing. I mean, you can just go on your computer and satisfy the pleasure principle. So you have billions of people satisfying the pleasure principle. And as you go, we're going to go into, you're stating in the book that a lot of this is to blunt ourselves against the ultimate pain that life does bring. And it brings pain to every human being at one time or another, and that we can't use the pleasure principle to do this. So this, this, this is going to lead to no growth. And then that goes back to the first question we were talking about the very beginning, which is, I hear this all the time. I still don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what I'm doing here. Why would I incarnate at this time in history? So if you could go ahead and take off on that for a little bit. So I, I don't know where this is going to take us. You know me well now. Yes. I can go off and so rain oh, it's me in. okay. I'm, go for it. <laughs> rain me in if I go too far afield. I'm a really, really big believer that only God exists. And it's one of the mantras I say to myself at night, you know, as I'm going to, to sleep. Only, uh, only God is real. Only love exists. Only God is real. Only love exists. So God is ultimate the love principle. And I said to you in the previous interview that love bifurcates into uh, light and um, logos. Light is the origin of all matter. You know, all matter is frozen light. And logos is the organizing principle that creates morphology out of matter. So it's logos, the word of God that fashions, you know, uh, kitty cats or oak trees or human beings from the same uh, kind of quantum soup, uh, the, the matter. Mm-hmm. And then uh, life, uh, light and uh, logos dance and they create life as we understand it. And the object of all life is to learn how to laugh. So it's the five L's, they call them the five L's. Love, light, logos, life, and laughter. And the laughter is about waking up to realization that we are not separate from each other. We're not separate from each other, from God, and we're not separate from nature. But God has self-fractured because if God is all that is, it is impossible for God to generate experiences. If, If there is nothing except God, there can be no experiences because there is no, there is no other. So God self-fractures. There's a beautiful phrase in, in Hebrew for that. It's called netzvotzim, the sparks of the divine. And these are holographic fractals of source. And the metaphor I use sometimes is like, uh, God is like the bee in a hive. And every morning, all the work, the bees go out and they gather nectar and pollen from all over the countryside. And they bring it back. They bring back the nectar and the pollen and the stories of while we're outside. So we are God's bees. We are the way in which God generates experiences. You know, there's the, the isness of God. We, some, we call the Father sometimes in Christianity. There's God's self-knowledge that we call the Logos or Jesus. And then there's the love that God has for whom she knows herself to be that we call the Holy Spirit. But that triumph, that triumvirate in some senses cannot experience unless it uh, manifests that which is not itself. And that's an illusion to begin with. And so every single one of us is the way in which God experiences. And uh, God needs to experience the entire spectrum of possibilities in all life forms, whether they're extraterrestrials, our human beings, you know, our uh, fish in a river. And all of us are bringing those experiences back, back to source. Now, pain is part of that realization. We're born, in our instance, into a planet which is subject to, you know, volcanoes, tsunamis, hurricanes. Part of my roof blew off last night in the wind here. So (laughs) that's part of what it is to be on planet Earth. And so in some senses, pain is the price of incarnation. 
but it's a price that uh, that um, has a huge ROI uh, return on investment. Yes, because when you learn to harvest the pain, you you learn this extraordinary compassion. Now the mistake we make is we turn pain into suffering, and they're very different. Pain is the price of incarnation. Not only can you not avoid it, if you try to avoid it, you're failing to harvest the opportunities of incarnation. But what happens is we create these extraordinary interpretations and these stories, and that's the suffering. So suffering is self-inflicted interpretation of pain. So I was threatening for years and years in my office in Los Altos to put a notice on my door that said, change the bloody story. Because 85% of the discomfort we experience is the stories we're telling about the painful experiences we're having. Instead of harvesting them, we become victims to them. Absolutely. And when I'm listening to you, what I'm thinking and reminded of is that when we experience pain, it's almost always the subconscious speaking to us. It is coming through, tapping us and reminding us of something, some experience, some trauma, some event that we found painful that's being triggered again right now. It is our greatest, I think, informant that we have is that the pain from the subconscious mind, because it's the only thing that gets us to stop and reflect on what just happened. So could you please riff on that a little bit? Because your book really does, a, I think, a lovely job of getting people to look into what they actually are. You have to be very honest in your reflections in this book of asking what your true emotions are um, and what they're not and what your true desires are and what they're not. And it, it's interesting if you see it all in black and white reflected back at you. So going back to this, let's go back to that thing a moment ago that I was saying about the subconscious mind being our greatest informant. Right. Right. Brilliant. So Bruce Lipton does a great job in this as well, talking about the fact that for the first six or seven years of our life, we're being programmed by society, our parents, our teachers, television, whatever it is. And we're like sponges just absorbing. And we believe that, you know, how we're seeing others live life is how life has to be lived. And so by the time we get to the age seven and we develop the use of reason, we've been programmed. And 95% of the decisions we make during the day are coming from a pre-programmed unconscious or subconscious. And only 5% are coming from actually looking around us and trying to make sense of it. So there's the kind of the, the, the unconscious operating there. Now, I believe that when we volunteer for incarnation, we come down bearing two kinds of gifts. The first kind of gifts are our talents. Every one of us comes with talents, whether it's musical talents or mathematical abilities or athletic capabilities or whatever it is. All of us come down with a few talents. But the talents do not belong to us. The talents are our gift to the world. It's like I'm a mailman with a bunch of letters. And I think because the envelopes are inside my mailbag, they belong to me. And they don't. They belong to the people whose names are on the envelopes. And my job is to deliver them. Now, if I hog these and refuse to deliver them, you know, nobody is going to get what they're, what they're supposed to get. Now, a lot of us think that our talents belong to us. And while we're entitled to make a living from our talents, we are not entitled to make a killing from our talents. We've come to give them to other people. So it's really upsetting to me to see, you know, great basketball players who are getting like $10 million for a two-year contract. And they think that they're God's gift to the planet. And they're coming maybe as entertainers, maybe to tell us, you know, what you can do if you practice. But they're like, they're hogging it. This is my money. This is my talent. Look how good I am. Now, this happens all over, not just in athletics. The second kind of gift we come down with are our are, are problems. Every single one of us agrees you know, to, to deal with two or three major issues or problems in our lifetime. It might be developing courage. It might be, you know, how to, uh, forgiveness, you know, resilience, whatever it is. You know, and these are the guarantee that we're going to have to stretch during an incarnation. But what we do with these, we project them onto other people. You know, I'm not an angry person. You know, Regina's just made me, made me mad. So I'm going to blame Regina for what I'm experiencing. So we project the gifts that were meant for ourselves to help us grow and stretch. And we hug the ones that were meant for others. And then we wonder, you know, <laughs> why life isn't working for us. <laughs> why it's not working. When in reality, when we feel that thing tripped in us and we're turning flesh and red, we're turning angry at something someone just said to us, the wisest thing to do would be to say, where did that come from in me? Right. And start trying to pull the threads and go back. 
Why am I reacting like this? Some people get it. They'll say, geez, I'm starting to behave like my mother or like my father. (laughs) But too often instead, whoever said the thing that made us angry, boom, they're going to get a barrage of every projection you can get. We've all been through this a lot. We've all seen it. That's that's not what we're talking about here. So talk us through when someone has just tripped and triggered you the most gracious way and self-healing way to go through that. I think everything should be harvested. There's a great story that Jesus tells in the, in the New Testament, and he's a master of paradox. But in this particular story, he t- says there was a very rich man who had a lot of property and a lot of servants, and he had a steward who was in charge of all his property. And he needed to go on a journey for a few years, so he put the steward in charge of his property. And he comes back, and he finds out that the steward has been embezzling his, 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 his property. So he calls the guy, and he says, uh, I, see, I hear that you've been embezzling my funds. I need to see the books. Give me an account of your stewardship. So this guy thinks, holy God, what am I going to do now? I'm, I'm too old to work. You know, I'm too embarrassed to beg. I know what I'm going to do. So he calls on his master's debtors in. He says to one guy, how much do you owe my master? He says, um, uh, 100 bushels of wheat. He gives, here's your bill, change it to 80 bushels. How much do you owe my master? He has 15 gallons of wine. Here's your bill, make it 10. So when he, when he got fired, he was going to go out and say, I need the back shishi, you know, I cut your bill in half or whatever. And then Jesus says a very strange thing. He says, the masters praise the unjust steward insofar as he had acted wisely because the children of this generation are wiser to their kind than the children of light. So was he praising this man's duplicity? No. He was saying, here's a guy who's able to turn every single situation to his own economic advantage. You know, when he was working, he was embezzling. When he got fired, he was taking back shishi, bribes from people. And Christ is saying, that's you. You should be able to turn every single life situation to your own spiritual advantage. So in the face of any event, any kind of a trip up, any pain, any kind of break in relationship, the question to ask is, how can I harvest this event in order to become a more spiritual person? How can, I, how can this event align me even more really with the purpose for which I incarnated? Yeah. And, and that and takes that, courage. It, it, it takes yeah. courage because as you say in the book, when someone's sitting there dumping on you yes. um, their own stuff and projecting on you, that's the last moment where you're feeling generous and saying, please show me the, the gold in this. <laughs> yes, yes. I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. How do you counsel people to do that personally when they're in the midst of it to not react? to go inward and see that this is an opportunity. There has to be something that interrupts that natural response or reaction. So one of the things I, if I'm working one-on-one people, uh, I have one approach. If I'm working with a couple, I have another approach. If I'm working one-on-one with somebody and they come in and they start dumping about such and such a person to this to me and the other person said that to me, I say, you know, the problem is I'm not that person's therapist and I've never met this other individual. There's only you in the room. So my job is to help ask, ask the kinds of questions that are going to let you figure out what you need to do with your life. I'm not going to be telling you what to do. I'm going to ask the kinds of questions that will inspire you to come up with the answers for yourself. So if I'm working one-on-one, that's my approach. If I'm with a couple and the two of them are coming to the room, I can tell immediately what the issue is, where they sit. You know, there was a couch in my office and a single chair. If one person sits in the couch and the other person sits in the chair, I know we got problems here to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Even if both of them sit in the couch, but one guy is looking out the window and the other guy is looking out the window at the other side, I know we got problems <laughs> here. They're not making any engagement. If they're sitting there with their arms crossed, I know we got problems. If they're refusing to look at each other, so I'm looking at the body language. And the first thing I say to them is, I don't want to hear what your partner's issue is. For the next five minutes, I want you to tell me what are you bringing to this relationship which is of value? And what is, are you bringing to this relationship which is problematic? Because you have your own personal history. I don't want you to tell me what your partner is doing wrong. 
I want you to tell me what are you contributing positively to this relationship and what issues are you bringing from your own history? And then the other person, what are you contributing to this relationship by way of you know, your gifts? And what are you bringing by way of your darkness? And now I want you to repeat what you heard the other person say. Don't accuse them, say, well, oh, okay, so I heard my partner say this and she's taking responsibility for X, Y, and Z. Or I heard my partner say that and he's taking responsibility for A, B, and C. And I said, them, right. In your case, what you need to work on is A, B, and C, not her X, Y, and Z. And what you need to be working is your X, Y, Z, not his A, B, C. So go home now and figure out what are you bringing to the relationship <laughs> that needs to change. So that's my approach. I don't want to be so, you know, I don't want to be working with people who are not in the room, you know, and right. joining with you and agreeing, oh, you're a victim, so I'm going to take your side. What a terrible person the other person is. There's right. no value in that. I can't change the other person. Uh, and you can't, the only thing you can do is you have the right and the ability and the responsibility to grow yourself. You don't have the right or the ability or the responsibility to change anybody else. But we keep trying to change the world. I can only be happy if the world kind of gets its act together. Otherwise, I'm going to be a victim for the rest of my life. And that's a guarantee for absolute failure, anxiety, depression. Yeah, absolutely. So we have to find that gold in ourselves. We have to know even in the moment. I mean, yeah, we're going to lose it sometimes and we're going to engage, but ultimately we have to back off and see where the gold was for us in that. What we're trying to mine from our own reactions to the situation, where that's coming from. And I think also be compassionate with ourselves that yes. it's not easy being here on earth. Yes. Uh, we do get triggered. We're not perfect. So yeah, thank you. For, thank you for that. The other thing is often you're talking about couples, but in general, with, among people, um, sometimes you have the same values, sometimes you have the same ideals, sometimes you think you do, but you might say, oh, we came together because we have the same ideals, you know, we really believe in this, but your values can be very different. So let's talk about this, both by way of uh, a situation that you told me about, personal to you, and in a couple situation, how that right. works individually right. and together. Okay. Right. So that's a hugely important distinction, Regina, because we tend to think ideals and values are synonyms and they're radically different. Ideals are that by which we set our compass in the sense that if somebody said one time, we navigate by the stars, but we can never reach the stars. So we need to have an ideal to which we aspire. But the values are actually what drive our performance. They're the kind of the uh, compromises we make with our ideals because of life situations and environmental circumstances. So the, uh, the values rarely match what the ideals are. So the, uh, the ideals are how I would be behaving if I were at, at my ideal best. And the values then are the actual compromises I make. And all institutions and all people go through this. So we have religion telling us that, you know, the ideal is love for everybody. And then the values are inquisitions and conquistadores, you know, and, and hell for all eternity. And so, <laughs> when you're living in a world where you're trying to control everything else, you compromise your ideals and you settle for values. You think about like countries, the ideal is, you know, that we are the peacekeepers and we are trying to export democracy to the rest of the world. The U.S. Yeah, the U.S. And then we have, you know, we have got uh, military personnel in like 150 of the uh, 191 countries in the world. And we're imposing our will on it. So there's the great ideal. We're the bringers of democracy. Here's the reality. You're, we're we're colonial, colonizing very, various, various places. Uh, the same thing with you know, family systems. Like the family value is why don't we all get on and love each other? And what happens is you get family vendettas. So this is the idea. Let's all love <laughs> each other. But then there's the vendettas. So my two favorite examples when I look at the discrepancy between ideals and values is this wonderful document the Declaration of Independence, which I believe actually is on a level with the scriptures for its extraordinary wisdom, but it's still is created by human beings. And the beginning of that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. There's an extraordinary ideal. All men are created equal. As long as you're not a woman, because then you're not allowed to vote, or as long as you're not a person of color, because then you could be enslaved or as long as you're not an heir from American Indian, because in that same document, they're called savages. So the ideal is that all men are created equal, but the values are, you know, we, we can't take the land from them if we regard that they're people like us, you know, and we need uh, labor for our, our, our crops, so we're going to pretend like these people are lesser than us, and you can't, God's sake, give women a vote? Are you serious? 
And they'll destroy the country in like one session. <laughs> and so there's this discrepancy. But over 250 years, we've begun to shrink the difference between the ideals and the values. And we've come a long, long way. I think it's an extraordinary experience in democracy uh, this country has undertaken over 200, about 250 years. Now, so for each of us then, as we come into life, I believe that the fastest way of discovering what your unique purpose is, is to list what your ideals are, to list what your values are, and then to spend your life shrinking the distance between the ideals and the values. And I've given several uh, kinds of uh, um, exercises in the book to help you kind of uh, navigate that. I thought it was very beautifully done, as a matter of fact, and very thought provoking. I mean, if you're going to engage with this little book, it's like one of those things that one should just take some time, maybe just take a couple of days <clears throat> and really think about it. Do these little exercises, get it out so you can see it for yourself. And it's incredibly instructive as to where you've been, especially in this thing you're talking about, your values versus your ideals. Okay. Um, another thing you talk about is patterns and we end up in our, how we end up in the same pattern. And you give some really interesting examples of how people end up very gritty, uh, of how people end up in the same situation over and over again. I see this in my own life and the people around me. Yes. And you use one, um, one example is I think he was a businessman that, yes. um, had uh, a mother who was, I believe, ill. He ended up with a woman in his life, his wife, who had developed an illness, and that was really draining and inconvenient. He left the situation, ended up with a woman. She became ill until finally he, yes. after he left all this behind, yeah. he yeah. became ill. So let's yeah. talk about these patterns we set up because they're not going to go away till we get it. No, they're not. And so that's what I mean by you know the problems with which we come into life. We're here to learn to be compassion in a lifetime, our resilience in a lifetime, our courage in a lifetime, our forgiveness in a lifetime. <clears throat> so that incarnation is going to keep giving us uh, opportunities to learn that lesson. And in this particular instance, this was a guy who had lots of opportunities to exercise compassion. Firstly, for his, his first wife who was ill, his second wife who was ill, his mother who was ill, and he didn't get the message at the time. And so finally, he's this really successful business, multimillionaire character. I think, you know, he's on top of life, you know, seeking pleasure, avoiding pain under all costs, avoiding responsibilities to deal with people who are in pain and suffering. And he winds up then himself finally having a very debilitating illness and has to be the recipient of compassion for others. So the realization was, okay, guy, if you don't, you know, exercise compassion by giving it to people who are in need of it, important people in your life, you're going to have to learn from the inside out. And often it will happen within a single incarnation. And then mm -hmm. sometimes it'll happen over a series of incarnations. And so uh, the question then becomes, when we meet the same situation for a second or a third or a fourth time, are we going to go around and around in a circle and just dig ourselves into a rut, like a needle in a gramophone? Or are we going to create a spiral? So each time we encounter the same thing, we're dealing with it more and more adroitly. But we will meet the same issue several times in any one incarnation until we really perfect it, until we really can mine it for what you know it has inside itself. We're going to keep meeting it. But we can either meet it as a rut, go around in circles, chasing our tail, or we can meet it as a spiral, and each time we deal in dealing more effectively with it. Yeah. So I give an, I give an exercise to help a person uh, uh, do that process. And I could talk about some of those if you wish. Yes. Oh, just one or two. And then yeah. we're going to go on to just explain this whole notion of what am I? What am I here for? You actually, um, as you said, the Ralph Metzner part of the book, he goes in his contribution is talking about these archetypes yes. um, of individuals and many, many systems have archetypes, but Absolutely. this isn't quite so pat because you have to evaluate yourself. You may fit in four out of six of them, but yeah. you're, you have a dominant theme that's in yourself that you may not even be recognizing till again, you see it on paper. And that's about finding out what you're what your true purpose is in life with all these other things you're talking about. So if you want to go into a couple of those points you were just speaking of, I'd appreciate it. Great. Brilliant. So there's one exercise that we have in the book and it's something that I've used for many, many, many years with my own clients. After one or two sessions, when I've kind of got a feel for them, I set them this exercise. I said, I want you sometime over the next week uh, to take uh, sheets of paper and I want you to create four columns. 
The first column is age. Uh, I want you to divide your life up into seven year chunks, zero to seven, seven to 14, 14 to 21, et cetera. So that's the first column. In the second column, I want you to write down who are the important characters in your life during that particular period. From zero to seven, who are the important people? Obviously, it's going to be parents or maybe sibling. You know, from uh, 14 to 21, who are the important people? Schoolmates or whatever. So the second column is, who are the important players in your life for each of those uh, seven-year segments? The third column is, what were the important events that happened during that particular segment? In, in your life, maybe from zero to seven, you went to kindergarten school, maybe 21 to 28, you got married, whatever it is. So what were the important events that happened during each of those seven year chunks? And then the, the fourth column is, what did you learn about life and yourself in that particular segment? And often this, can, this one can only be done retroactively. It's not like that as a seven-year-old, you can look back and say, oh, I think I've learned, you know, such and such. So when you look back, maybe at age, I'm 75 right now, so I'm coming up to the end of my 11th, you know, seven-year segment. I look back and say, okay, I know who the important people were for me at various stages. I know the important events uh, were, you know. So I wonder what were the great lessons that retroactively I can see. And I guarantee you, when you do this exercise, the uh, characters will change. You know, you're going from, you know, kind of kindergarten to grade school, to high school, to college, to marriage, you know, to travel, whatever it is. So the characters will change over your lifetime. The events will change over your lifetime. But I guarantee you, you're going to see the same lesson repeat again and again and again. At age six, at age 36, at age 66, you're going to see, you have an opportunity to learn the very same We're lesson. slow learners. Very slow learners, yeah. But it's a really good exercise to be able to encapsulate in a few sheets of paper. Oh, my God, I can now see what the trajectory of my life has been, what the opportunities were, and how I either took them and learned, or I refused to take them, and I'm going around and just chase, chase my tail. So that's a, a kind of an exercise. And the book's chock full of these kinds of exercises. It's very self-revealing, as I've said a couple of times before. Okay, so you were talking about this earlier, aligning to our missions, and I brought it up a second ago about, you know, these archetypes that we fall into, and we usually have subcategories as well. And tell us really kind of the beauty in determining what these are when people are feeling kind of lost, a candle in the wind. And a lot of people are feeling like that because the world has changed very rapidly. Right. Why is it right. so important that we are able to identify these things in ourselves in a clear okay. way? Right. So I really, really believe that um, there's this great notion in, in Hinduism that the soul consists of two parts. They call it the Jiva and Atman. And uh, Jiva is that aspect of soul that incarnates again and again and again. And Atman is that uh, element of the soul that never leaves the sight of God or is mm -hmm. always with source. And they have this ongoing connection. And the example they use is like Jiva is like a bird who comes down. Say, there are two birds sitting on a treetop, Atman and Jiva. And every so often, Jiva comes down to the ground and is pecking seeds off the ground and walking around in the undergrowth. And Atman is on the treetop. And then Jiva comes up at the end of the light and says, here's what it's like down there. Here's what, it, here's what seeds feel like. Here's what the earth feels like under your feet. And that was saying, and here's what it looks like from up here. I had a meta perspective and I was a little bit concerned because I could see a tiger, you know, walking through the undergrowth or something. I was kind of concerned about you. And so they, they swap stories. Now we're constantly in contact. Uh, the soul never, you know, commits even 10% of its energy to any incarnation. 90% of it is, is with source or with God and is communicating constantly with us through dreams, deja vu experiences, sudden insights, visionary experiences, chance encounters. It's constantly downloading, you know, archetypal information to us. But if we're not aware of our intuitive faculties, we ignore it and we just depend on our, our sensorium. So there's this constant conversation that's going on between the two. So in some senses, prayer is when Jiva speaks to Atman, and meditation is when Atman speaks to Jiva. So there's this constant two-way conversation. And it is to encourage us in the journey and to give us insights to be able to harvest the experiences we're exp you know, as, as we, we have as Jiva and to give us the courage to continue. And it constantly reminds us that we are spirit beings having a human experience. I say we are souls on safari. We're spirits in spacesuits. These things are just temporary, you know, spacesuits that we carry for incarnational purposes. So we have to constantly disidentify 
with the physical spaces or with our emotions or with our mentation or with the professions we're in or the relationships of which you are a part and realize, you know, that, that's just, there are aspects of the spacesuit, but they do not define who I am. And so in some senses, evolution is the kind of the constant movement to disidentifying with lesser senses of self and re-identifying with greater senses of self. Mm -hmm. So there's a great word in Luke's gospel where he has Jesus saying, you must be compassionate as your heavenly father is compassionate. Now, although the New Testament is written in Greek, Jesus would have been speaking Aramaic. And the word for compassion in Aramaic is rachamim. And rachamim in Aramaic is the plural for the word for a womb. And so here's Jesus saying, you must be womb-like as the birthing principle of the cosmos is womb-like. So what is a womb? It is that which can conceive life, carry life, and birth life sequentially, not just once. It continue, can continue to birth. And so Christ is saying to us, that's what you must be. You must give birth to greater and greater versions of yourself. You must disidentify with lesser important versions of yourself, like your physicality or your emotionality or your intellectuality. And you're not finished birthing until you give birth to God. And that's what Meister Record said very famously in a Christmas homily about the year 1300. He said, of what use to me is it that my Savior was born of a virgin <clears throat> 1300 years ago? If he's not born again in my time and in my heart, every single one of us is meant to be a mother of God. And so that's really what it's about. We are not done evolving. We're not enlightened beings. And we've given birth to the, divinity, the inner divinity, which connects us to source itself. But until we recognize our own divinity and the divinity of everything else, we're going to, we're going to treat each other as separate and maybe inimical uh, uh, considerations. Yeah. Indeed, in this process, all of it is the, the beauty of earth is uh, the notion that all this is done, everything we do is the consequence of a choice that we made a moment ago, or a year ago, or a, a lifetime ago. And when you're talking about the whole practice of our making these choices leading toward ultimately the goal you just spoke of, you say oftentimes for it to be a truly actionable choice there is an element that could, that could be painful involved. Yes. In other yes. words, there's a risk of some kind in making an actionable choice. Yes. So yes. let's talk about that because, okay. again, people want to avoid risk and avoid okay. pain. So many people find themselves paralyzed making no choice at all. Okay. So that's, that's hugely important. It has to be actionable. And so in some senses, <clears throat> the ideals are how we'd like to navigate the values are how we actually do navigate. And the question is, you know, what is driving, you know, who's driving the car? My hands on the wheel are going to determine where the car is going to go. If I have a kind of an intended destination, I say, I want to go to Palo Alto. But in actual fact, uh, I really want to go to uh, Auckland. My hand is going to take me to Auckland. I can make the decisions that take me to Auckland. So there's a stated destination, which is Palo Alto. But there's what I really, really, really want to go is Auckland. It's, only go, it's going to go to the ladder. And that's composed of the moment-by-moment -moment decisions I'm making along the road. Now, unfortunately, many of those decisions are kind of, a, a kind of spontaneous, unconscious, or subconscious decisions. They're not being thought out properly. And so being aware of the decisions and the consequences of the decisions and creating actually um, goals and timelines. So if I say, for instance, <clears throat> I want to run a marathon. So I, I ran a marathon myself one time, I think it was um, 2005 up in, uh, in Alaska. <clears throat> it was called the Mayor's Midnight Run. It's the Saturday nearest the, uh, the summer solstice. And so I'm preparing for this marathon for about five or six months. Now, if I say I want to run a marathon, but then I never do anything about it. I'm sitting on the couch, you know, you know watching television and you know, eating popcorn or whatever. I'm never going to run a marathon. So I need a goal. The goal is, you know, I want to run a marathon. So what's the action plan? I need to get into some kind of a training program you know, that'll bring me up to speed to run the marathon. You know, and what's the timeline? I have to make a phone call. What's the timeline? I need to make a phone call sometime this week. It's not like, oh, I'd love to run the marathon. Wouldn't it be great to run a marathon? Yeah. More popcorn, more <laughs> popcorn. So I've got this idea I want to pursue. I have to create a plan. I have to have a goal and I have to have a kind of a, a timeline attached to it. And that's true about life itself. 
you know, whether it's becoming a more compassionate person, whether it's learning to be kind of a, a better communicator, I have to have, you know, what does it mean to be a better communicator? Maybe I need to do a weekend course. Maybe I need to check out a video. Maybe I need to learn a nonviolent communication. And when am I going to do that? Yeah, I need to pencil into my calendar and say, okay, I'm going to make a phone call on Monday next. And so you got to make it really empirical and validatable and measurable. Otherwise, it's an airy fairy idea that goes nowhere. And what happens now is because so much is available, we think it, we have it validated, we can go do a search online, it'll give validation for what we think we should do and watch someone else maybe even do it. And oftentimes, the mere perception of engaging with it, just kind of mentally and emotionally by observation, is satisfying enough for a lot of people that we don't follow through. And this is true, I see a lot with um, people who spend a tremendous amount of time on the computer um, are kind of limiting their abilities and skill sets in the outside world because, you know, being able to watch someone play the piano or watch someone do yes. something is so gratifying. Yes. You don't bother taking the time to discipline, uh, take the discipline to do it yourself, to actually put some energy and effort into it. And this is, to me, what I'm seeing as a growing problem is this notion of our own lives becoming virtual reality. And before we sign off, um, can you talk about that for a moment? Yeah, yeah. I agree totally with you. And so uh, virtual reality in some senses <laughs> is neither virtuous nor real. <laughs> it's a made-up scenario that's been created by some extraordinary IT minds that are substituting the reality of incarnation on the way to enlightenment with the kind of a, a sensory stimulation, you know, uh, where you don't even have to go off the couch and do anything else. So uh, nobody gets to heaven through virtual reality. You get to, to the exercise of virtues, of walking the talk, of stepping into the moccasins of somebody else, you know, shouldering some of their pain, compassionately uh, reaching out to other people. Uh, so the, the very the deepest form of reality is to recognize the divine in everything else that exists and to relate to that divine. And to the best of my knowledge, TVs are not divine. Uh, virtual reality is not divinity. It's a substitute for and a kind of it's like taking taking God out of the equation completely and thinking that just by sensory overload that you can feed the soul. Sensory overload is exactly the opposite of how you feed the soul. And so exercising this extraordinary space that we have, it has physicality, it has emotionality, it has intellectuality, and it has personality. And all these four facets of the space will need to be developed. And so that means, you know, indulging the sensory apparatus by going out in nature. What are the spiders doing today? For the last two weeks, I've had uh, this extraordinary invasion of crows. <laughs> Literally hundreds of crows have descended on my home. It's obviously the mating season. And they wake me up at five o'clock in the morning and they're using my roof as a kind of a boudoir, you know, for their lovemaking. <laughs> I heard this all noise at five o'clock in the morning and I had to go out and try to go, no, no. <laughs> and they scatter for five minutes and then they come back again. But um, maybe if I were more enlightened, I just watch the mating and listen to the sounds <laughs> they're making you know, and realize, okay, how do they know it's the mating season? It only lasted for about five days and now they're gone. I'm looking at the California poppies all over the place. They started about uh, a week and a half ago, and uh, they will be gone after a while. I'm watching what they do. I watched a, a California poppy one time shedding its bonnet. I didn't realize when the California poppy begins, it has like um, a bonnet, like a, a dunce's cap, a little green bonnet. And I sat beside it, and as it's opening, the bonnet is moving further and further up along the four golden leaves. And finally, it popped and it fell off. I looked around, and the ground was strewn with discarded bonnets. But if you just looked at the California poppies, and you saw the bonnets, and then you saw them without the bonnets, you wouldn't realize the labor pains they went through to gradually force this bonnet off their head until finally it fell off, and then they're opening their, their eyes to the sun. And then at night, they close back up again. You wouldn't see that, you know, if you're stuck in front of a television set. Absolutely. That's a perfect example. And Zeus and I are going to be doing a conversation about AI and robotics and how the world of entertainment is making this very alluring and sexy and what we're going to have to bypass if we choose that path in life. So I know that's not your path. That's not my path, but it's absolutely fascinating how it's being foisted upon us as a very sexy thing to do, making your life even 
more resistance free, even easier, having even less to do in the organic world around us. And finally, before we go, uh, Sean, one of the things the book talks about throughout is that through the pain of life and life has pain, my, life has pain. The one thing that we're really tasked with is learning to love through it. Absolutely. Just Absolutely. get with that for a sec. Yeah. I don't think it's possible to love without pain. Yeah, uh, love without pain in some senses is kind of a plastic reality. There, there's no movement whatsoever. There's no growth possible, and so we 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 uh, signed up to be in a planet in which we would experience particular kinds of limitation in the very same way that an athlete is going to train by punishing her body in some sense, lifting weights or, or running early in the morning, whatever, in order to experience the thrill of breaking a four-minute mile, and so uh, pain. It's not that we signed up for a planet and, uh, oh, my God, I suddenly realized it's a, uh, a painful place to be in. I said, send me down there. It is through pain I will learn to be compassionate, and therefore I will learn to grow. In the absence of pain, love is impossible. Thank you for that, Sean. As always, um, <clears throat> lots to think about in this little book. Tell me the subtitle again, because I like the book so much that when as soon as I finished it, which was... Uh, just a couple hours before coming on with you right now, um, I gave it away to somebody who I thought really <laughs> needed it. <laughs> so tell us the subtitle again, because I don't have it sitting in front okay. of me. Okay, so it's got, why is the title, what, what your life is telling you about who you are and why you're here. What yes. your life is telling you about who you are and why, and you're, why here. you're here. Very good. Excellent little book. And I highly recommend it for anyone just feeling untethered right now, pick up this little book and just start using it. It's a wonderful tool. And Sean, thank you so much for your wisdom, your stories, and ultimately for the most loving view of life that's possible in a human. I really appreciate you. A big hug to you, Regina, and a big hug to anybody who's watching this video. Big hugs back. Okay. 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 To be able to connect with more of Sean's work, such as his amazing spiritual videos, all free to the public, you can go to spiritsinspacesuits.com. Until next time, thank you for joining us here on reginameredith.com.